All right. Huh, we live. <laughs> and welcome back for another wonderful episode of the Written Undead podcast. I am Jack the Smack, apparently, today, thanks to <laughs> our wonderful leader here, Randy Bonds. And as always, I am joined by Richard Ryan Rose. What's going on with you, brother? Not much, man. Living the dream. Beautiful. <laughs> and Angel, the man, Ramon. What's happening over on your side of the pond, brother? Not much, brother. Just uh, just having some fun with you. Making fun of your titans and all that. As always. So, as everyone can see, Patty is not here. As it turns out, she was ambushed on the way to the show. Javin has her locked away in his castle somewhere. We've sent our top-notch team to go get her out. Hopefully, she'll be around for the next episode later this afternoon. Mm-hmm. Fingers crossed that he doesn't dismember her or do some other horrific thing to her, like make her eat Marmite. <laughs> <laughs> but I give to you a very special guest, a very good friend, a very amazing writer, the one, the only, Ben Black. What is happening, man? It's, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks uh, Thanks very much for inviting us. So what are you working on currently? Currently editing. Um, editing for me second full-length zombie novel. Um, my first one, Pestilence Reigns, is already out there, and I did release a short um, towards the end of last year, which is also out there. That one's out there for free. Um which I believe somebody may or may not have hanging on his wall display at this point in time. Um, so it's the follow-up to that one. I've been working on that the last couple of months, going through all the edits. Um, I was almost at the end, and then I've had to rewrite a full chapter. So now I've got that to go back through for editing purposes, and then uh, probably go through another phase of editing after that, just to make sure everything's all polished off and tied up with a bow. Well, what causes you or any writer, because I got three of them in front of me, what causes you to suddenly go back after you finish something and go, wait a minute, mm. and you start re- re- redoing something? What, what happened? How did that, how'd that shake out? In this instance, it was um, somebody read through it, and he just said, it's shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, the, I mean, the, the context of it was it was a, the chapter that kind of builds up to the the appearance of the zombies, and he said the kind of the build up didn't the pay up didn't like didn't fit the build up, so it was a build up build up, and then it was just kind of a. In my head, it seemed fine, but it, it's obviously the, the other authors are going to probably agree with us when we read something back that we've written makes perfect sense to us, and we know exactly what we're talking about. But then when you get the the, the third party in, they can read through it and say. I don't even know what you're talking about here because in, in, in my mind, I've mentioned something or I've referred to something and I haven't, but I know it's ah. there. So when somebody else is reading it, they're like, why has he suddenly got this, this giant car? Where's this giant car come from? And things like that. So it's a, that, that's the, that's the beauty of the beta readers really as well. They can read through things and pick out the bits and pieces that need to be changed, that need to be reviewed. And in this instance, it was a, it was more or less a full chapter where the, the build-up wasn't worth the actual eventual payoff. So I rewrote that chapter and uh, that's come back and it's, it's, it's much better. It's not shit anymore. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's uh, always a good thing. It is. So I've got that chapter to work through. And then, as I say, once I've done that, I'm just going to, I'll get it all converted to a text, um, text to audio file so I can read through it with somebody else reading it to us to hopefully pick up those last few bits and pieces that uh, that may have slipped the net, because obviously we're all human. Um, so we, we, do, we do make mistakes, and even the, however many passes, um, however many passes you make through your work, you're always going to miss something. And something I've seen on a, on, a, um, on a meme a couple of weeks ago is the best way for an author to find type and errors is to publish the book come back three months later and look at a random page and find something straight away. And that's, uh, I don't know if that's why a lot of authors don't actually go back and read them once they've, uh, once they've published, because it's done. They, they don't want anything else to do with it onto the next. So hopefully, I should be looking to get that next book out sometime at the beginning of the new year, hopefully. And awesome. uh, this is me. This is me editing copy. It's uh, always sizable. And uh, you can see that. 
It's got all the holy crap. Holy, that is thick. Post-it notes. It's really thick. It's half the size of the first one, so I've I have learned. I am learning. Size needs to be a uh, a bit more in control, so I have halved it, um, but then also added another twenty thousand words. But I can deal with that. <laughs> hey, I got a question for you. When mm-hmm. you do your editing, uh, do you use any kind of any kind of a you know, specific software? I mean, I use the Grammarly software, and then then I have a pro go through it. But uh, is there yeah. anything other than that that you use? Yeah, I mean, Grammarly is the the thing that. Well, I'll use it, but obviously not rely on it because it's oh. it's the, the, nothing. Nothing replaces a, a human, really. Despite what films like The Terminator and Robocop tells you, this you mm-hmm. kind of replace the human touch. Um, and nothing's more satisfying when you look at something on Grammarly and you can say, "Ignore," because this is incorrect. That's that's right, the smug yes. smug satisfaction I keep for the machines in that place. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so I, I will use that and then I'll get someone else to go through it to point out things that not so much grammar wise, but structure wise, plot device wise and stuff like that. So there's the, um, uh, me, mine's blank on blank. I kind of think of what phrase, what phase of editing that. There's the there's the grammar and spelling and then there's the the, the plotting. I can I kind of think off the top of my head because me, mine's gone blank. Developmental, um, developmental editing, copy editing. Yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. And then uh, once I've done those changes, like like I mentioned before, there I'll read and listen to it, and and uh, run it through Grammarly again just to make sure that any changes I've done haven't undone anything else. Because that's that's the worst part I found when I'm doing the editing and going through it, and then I'm sitting there working on it, and I'm thinking, what fresh hell have I opened up elsewhere? <laughs> because I've changed something here. And is that going to match up with something else over there? So that's the uh, that's another reason why I like to have the the read back through just to just to make sure that I haven't uh, I haven't summoned some type of beast that I've inadvertently destroyed part of the story over. So, as you're developing your stories, what is the hardest thing to come up with? I mean, granted, you could rank them one through five, <clears throat> but is it? the characters you want to use is it the direction you want them to go in is it who lives who dies what's the hardest thing for you when you write these stories and i think oh i'm just trying to think because um, you, you've mentioned a few different things there that uh that are covered off by it so um i think it's coming up with the the characters that are realistic and don't do things that they wouldn't do. Um, mm-hmm. I've fin- recently just finished um, a science fiction one, which again is off going off soon towards a state of editing. Um, so I had a whole plan for that about what the characters were going to do and how they were going to develop. And as characters will do when you're writing them, they've decided to go off and do their own thing. So somebody who was going to be right at the end kind of got killed off like 10 chapters before the end. So that, that that took us back by surprise because I hadn't expected him to die there, but he did. He shouldn't have went where he did. So um, it happens, I guess. And that's that, that's the thing. It's you, you make the characters, you know what you want them to do. And then it's it's getting them to actually do it and, and making sure that they're doing something because it makes sense and not just because you think, oh, it'd be great if this guy does that even though it doesn't doesn't really have any any bearing or semblance to his character. So it's keeping track of the characters, what they're going to do and making sure, as I say, that it, it sits within their, their personality range. Well, speaking for the fans, you have proof. These <laughs> characters do exist. They are real. Otherwise, they couldn't think for themselves and go off on their own way. <laughs> I said it. That's, uh... So... so Tell me a little bit about what's going on behind you right there. It's I'm only bringing this up because when I first got to talking to Randy earlier, he was showing me his bookshelf behind him, and it was actually fascinating just right. what someone has behind them. What do you have behind you back there? Right, so on this side, it's uh, – hang on, because I'm looking at a mirror image, and it's confusing. Right. Uh, this, this, this side, I, I Trust me, I do it with that. <laughs> this is a collection of books and um, – there's family photo albums there. There's some comic books. 
Um, I do like my comic books. And on this side, there's a Merry Christmas sign. And there's also, oh. this is me, board games that I, I like to play, but it's sometimes difficult to get the crowd in to, to commit to a couple of hours to sit down for a, a good board game or two. But I do, I do have a relatively regular schedule for them. So that's, uh, I get them played, but I have more than I feasibly have time to play at the minute. So that's uh, that, that, that's one of my problems. I think that's one of my vices, um, just spending money on needless, priceless plastic tat, I suppose, and letting it gather on the, on the shelves. So what's your favorite game? Well, at the minute, um, we are playing through um, a campaign on the Resident Evil 2 board game. I know that might that might pick up Angel's interest because I know he's a big fan of the computer games as well. You as well? I didn't even know that that was a thing. Oh, yeah. it's uh, It's been out for a couple of years. It, it was um, something that I'd, I'd originally missed on Kickstarter before I started getting addicted to Kickstarter and putting money into board games which i don't have time to play oh yeah. <laughs> there's so many of them back then that yeah it's amazing yeah i i, um, I, I fact a couple of them that you know unfortunately didn't make meet their target but yeah yeah I might, so I, I might be some board games even though i got nobody to play with but <laughs> hey well the the beauty is a lot of them do actually have solo modes now which is uh Obviously, it's it's really sad for, for someone to just sit and play a board game on their own, but I haven't yeah. done it because <laughs> oh, man. sometimes it, it's the best way to learn the rules, as it were. So sit down, go through a, a game, and then when my friends do come over, I kind of sound more like what I know what I'm talking about, even though I may not. They haven't read the rules. They don't know. Just make it up. It's very true. Yep. So your series that you're currently working on right now where did it come from did uh, did you just wake up in the middle of the night screaming in terror and this was an idea or were you just riding down the road and you saw an ice cream stand and pictured a zombie beside it no what it's, happened? Uh, it's well it was something that i started a long long time ago like when i was in like high school um i don't know what the age bands compare to to uh, things like american high schools or stuff like that but we started high school at the age of 13 and then we were kind of up to the age of 16. So I think it covered like three or four years. Um, and I was, it was at the end of my high school period, like that, that. So I must have been about coming up to 15, 16. Um, and there was a, a lesson that we had, which was, it was, it was electronics. And I think um, there was just, there just seemed to be a lot of spare time in the, uh, in the lessons where we would we'll have periods of being like really busy and doing all this, um, circuitry stuff and things like that with wires and trying to make fake coins out of solder and things like that because we were kids, you know, that's what we did. Um, mm-hmm. And there was, like I said, there was there was the spare time, so I just started to piece together like a story. And originally, um, it was a very short story. It was like 20, 30 pages maybe. Um, it was um, the, the way that I often did a lot of stories back in high school. It was me and me friends doing something um but uh it developed from there so it, the idea kind of came about in um as i say in high school so that's when i thought right zombies in my town where i live that's what i want to do and at the time like i say this is this is going back some time so this would have been 90 95 96 okay. um at the time that i was aware of because this was obviously before the internet was as all powerful and encompassing as it is now. I wasn't aware of that many, if any, zombie stories or books or films or anything that were actually set in Britain, in England. Um, so at the time, I thought, I'll do this because I don't know of any. And it's not to say that there wasn't, it's just to say that I wasn't physically aware of any. Um, so I started to build up on this idea. And then um, as I grew up and developed and left high school and went on to college and things like that the characters evolved into completely different people to who the they may have been based on originally and um, like some 10 or 15 years later so there's everything has kind of developed and changed as i grew both in person and in my writing style as well and um, mm-hmm. so it was originally all written as a first person narrative with just the the main character may or may not have been based on a slightly hairier version of myself um 
so it was first person narrative structure um and i'd, I'd been working I'd, loads and loads of different drafts had went about as i'd carried on with it so um like I say, every now and then, as my style developed and as my writing style changed, I've started to rework it. Um, and then there was at one point I just thought I'd, I'd been reading that the best way to try and get something published was that you would have um, something like short stories, perhaps printed in different like magazines and things like that. Because um, again, before the internet, so we had magazines, which obviously the younger ones might not know. It's like printed out sheets of the internet all stapled together. It's really good. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, Bangoria. Exactly. Yes. Uh -huh. um, so the, the intention was I'm going to write a short story um, which will act as kind of like an introduction to this. So then I can say to people, well, I've had this published in a magazine and this is the full story that follows on from it type of thing. Um, and then it, it just, it snowballed. So it went from a, the first person narrative and I completely rewrote everything into the third person, which it was, it worked out much better because it gave the opportunity for a lot more character development for other characters. And mm -hmm. um, so it's, that's probably why it expanded into such a, the huge book that the first one actually is, um, which hands up looking back now, I know that uh, the size of it is, it's it's far too big, um, which is why I'm taking that on board on the the work that I'm doing at the minute. And like I say, the the, the follow up is it's half the size, um, which is half the size, but still plenty of stuff going on there. Okay. Um, so that that was the that was that was the the kind of development of it. It started off me as a first person, developed fully into a more more structured and more. Um, more fully developed um, third person out structure, which is uh, which is the 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 beast that's out there now. One, Rich, you got something? Uh, not well. So you know, as far as your main characters, there, what is their? Uh, are your you know what what's his background as far as? What did he do before the zombie apocalypse and all that? Yeah, so so the main character, um, it starts off with him as being, um, I suppose, he, he worked in like a, a government style office. So he's like, um, he's just like an internal internal mail delivery type of guy, um, mm -hmm. varying parcels and uh, mail from one department to another. So again, it's it is a job that I had in the past. So that's uh, <laughs> that, that you, you, you take, you take things that, that you know from basically. So that was the, that was the scenario it was, it was, I just, he didn't have a job initially in the very first drafts, but once I had a job, I just thought, well, I'm going to use that as the basis of it. Um, and it was, it went in, there was an earlier draft where it was kind of detailed a lot more at the beginning. Um, and then when I had somebody reading through the story, they just said, we don't need to know, everything that he does from getting up to going into work to things finally happen, take out the first five or six pages and just have it stuff happening straight away. So um, it is touched on briefly, but because the way that it just kind of starts and develops straight away, it doesn't linger on his job, but it was that he was an um, internal male guy, um, just a, a normal person. I think that, that was me because, because it was kind of based on me and I'm not a, super soldier i'm not a um i'm not a so no so no military background anything no. like that hmm? nothing no so i just figured you know what you're right oh sorry you're right what you know um so i went with a guy working in a government office delivering post and then the shit hits the fan exactly yes uh -huh. beautiful so uh, i got a question hey jump hmm? on in there bud yeah but yeah i got a question uh ben uh do, when, when do you see yourself? Do you think you'll ever become a full time author? Is this, is this something you might do full time? Oh, yes, without a doubt. Um, I've got six years, no, sorry, seven years left on my mortgage on the house. Once, right. I've done, once I've done that and I've paid off, ideally, I would like to at least drop one day of full time work so I can dedicate at least one full day of, of a week to writing. Because at the minute, um, I've got the full-time job 
sometimes I'm doing a 12 hour shift. So then when I sign off from that and that's it, the, end, the day is ended. Sometimes I don't get more than an hour or two to do any type of writing or editing or stuff like that. And sometimes if you're doing it in a lot of short bursts, mm-hmm. you don't feel like you're getting anywhere. Right. Or it seems like you could think I've spent a week and a half writing out this one scene and it feels like it's went on forever. And then when you read it back, it's only like a couple of pages and think, well, what have I been doing? What's been happening with with uh, with my time management here? So I feel like if I can get to that stage and then potentially build it up and up and up, but I'm always aware of um, the whole, well, the, the number of books that I've got, I suppose, really. Um, I'm working on my second zombie one, full length zombie one. Um, also working on my second full length um, science fiction one. So there's a reasonably small catalogue, but hopefully once I can start getting more of them out there, more of them developed and out there and published and then concentrate, because at the minute I'm concentrating more on the writing than what I am for the advertising side of things. Why? Uh, mm-hmm. Because I feel like it's, it's going to be easier to, well, not easier, because it's never easy to just advertise, is it? But you it's going to be- more time. Exactly, yes. Um, if I can spend, get more of an actual catalogue of books out there, then it's going to be more um, more worth my time to actually devote less time to writing, but more time to, to pushing. Because at the minute, it's all it's all the time balance between work, family, um, writing, and then the advertising. But then in my eyes, I can only advertise if I've got stuff to advertise, which means I've got to spend the time putting in and do the writing first, and then moving on to the, the advertising. That's the theory. Um, right. I'll see, I'll see I how mean- it pans out. <laughs> I mean, call, I mean, call me crazy or, or call me a hypocrite if you want, but I, I believe it's never too late to start, you know, being a writer. It's never too late to uh, get your books out there. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, although I, I'm right a hard on myself, but, they, you know, the reality is you're never too old. Uh, you know, how, how old are you, Ben? Uh, I mean, you don't have to say. I mean, are you in your upper 40s or? I'm in my lower 40s. <laughs> all right. All right. Yeah. Uh, a second part of the question, Ben, uh, do you intend to stay writing horror and strictly horror? Um, well, like I say, I've, I have done a science fiction one. It's, it, it's not a kid's book, though, so it's, it is still, uh, it's still a bit grisly and a bit... Uh, I've got thumbs up from Jack there. It's still, um, <laughs> it, is, it is still um, a bit grisly and a bit gory, but that's, I suppose that's the... That's the, that's the style of, of the things that I like. A lot of the, um, we do still have a lot of horror DVDs in the house. We've got uh, a big following on that. So it, it kind of, it, it is, it is what I like without wanting to sound like too much of a psychopath, I suppose. I do like, uh, <laughs> well, I do well, like well, a, well, you did, uh, you did mention to me one day, uh, I don't know when that, you know, you, you read mostly horror and that's pretty much it. Mm-hmm. Uh, horror and sci-fi for the yeah. most part. That's right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have read a couple of other things. Um, again, I don't know how big he is in America. It's uh, I've, I've read a series of books by uh, Andy McNabb, who was a former SAS guy, and he wrote a, lo- a long series um, with one of his characters. And obviously, that was drawn heavily from his previous military experience. So that was something different for me to read because it, it wasn't zombies. And uh, although some of the things that were in there were come across as quite horrific it wasn't an actual actual horror book um and it certainly wasn't science fiction so it was definitely something different for us there um which kind of gives a, a different perspective on um on what's what is out there and what's available and i have read a few um a few fantasy different fantasy books as well um a couple based on the um in the the warhammer um 40,000 40, i can't remember um so that's like a different type of fantasy genre there but I think because of because it, it's always been I mean I remember watching the film Alien when I was six years old um so that's had a big impact on on me and, and what I like and stuff like that and I've, I've got a load of plastic figures up there on top of the unit there that shows me me love and dedication for the aliens um, and that's a uh, that that's obviously something that I suppose that that maybe that's why I've got so many horror films I guess because I watched Alien when I was six and probably shouldn't have. But uh, um, same here. Yeah, same. Well, it, well, it hasn't done anyone any harm, then, really, has it? Hmm? I don't know. Uh, 
<laughs> you know, we all turned out just fine, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We're all good. Yeah. So now, but, had, have you, had you ever read, um, since we're on the alien side of things, mm-hmm. had you ever read uh, Mark Tufo's Indian Hill? I haven't, no. Ooh, if you like the alien side of life, you mm-hmm. got to check that one out. Yeah, you absolutely serious. got to check that one out. Oh, oh he yeah. slams it. And he's got multiple different races that he works in, all the while still using his Mike Talbot character. Oh, mm-hmm. so good. So good. Mm-hmm. And you will love Drabaybon, which is basically a giant, armored, weapon-wielding crocodile. Yeah. N- enough right. said. <laughs> <laughs> so... When you get into, you know, you've got your book pretty much done. You've about got it wrapped up. What makes you decide on what the cover should look like? What do um, you want to tell with the cover? Yeah, I think the cover, well, it's weird because I've, I've got in my head, I know that it's going to be a series of books. Um, and I think once I'd finished the first one, I realized it was going to be a series of different stories. Um so I was tr- trying, kind of wanting to have like the the, sim- the covers on a similar type of similar type of theme. Where it was, I wanted to know people to know that it was a zombie book, I suppose. Um, so I wanted to have the zombie on the cover, um, and I know that they do say that you need to look at the covers in the market to see what is the current trend at the minute and see like to to kind of to kind of judge and base on what the covers are actually going to be. Um, and I know that there is some people who don't do that. Um, so I kind of decided to not do that. Um, and I just wanted to have the, you. The, the, the zombie on the, on the front there. So I know the, the book that you've got on your wall there, mm-hmm. that's the, uh, the MRI scan. I can never can tell if it printed out well enough, but there is actually a skull face in the brain, but I don't think it's come out clear enough because it seemed fine in the proof that I got. And then when it got actually okayed, it wasn't actually as light as it was. But I think, I do think that Amazon say that there's always differences in the, in the qualities and the colors that they have put out there. So oh, he's, what's he doing? He's, he's climbing, he's climbing his wall. <laughs> he does this sometimes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what's he got? The beauty of having the wall, ladies and gentlemen. All right. <laughs> so we can get that right. Yep. Up I there. see it. I nice. Just see it. Just see it. I see there it. you go. To the jack. So, yep. There you go. There you go. There you and, go. Uh, there goes the note. There goes the special note. There's me. Thank Ter- you so much for that. Terrible handwriting. Yep. <laughs> That's why writers have their keyboards. I, I got. I got you beat on the terrible handwriting. Trust me. <laughs> Half the time I can't read what I just wrote. Yeah. So back up. Okay. Yeah. Give them time to come back from the wall there. <laughs> How many at books least, do you have out right now? Um, two out at the minute. Well, three, including the short that uh, Jack's just held out there. That was a uh, that was the short that Jack's just held out there was the um, when we had a, um, a online zombie convention last year. I think it was, was it last year, um, mm-hmm. Angel. Uh huh. Yeah. So when we had that out last year, um, loads of people kind of put together um, a short just to like showcase the the world of their of their main zombie um, of their main title. So that's what I wrote for that, um, and then I just thought, well, I may as well still keep it out there. So it is still out there. It's it is free on Kindle. Um, obviously, nothing's free as a paperback because you've still got to uh, still got to pay for the paper and that. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> So, like, like we're, we're talking there about the um, the cover. So when I did that one, is it? Can you see? Is it too? I can. Yeah, it's off to yeah, the it's to, it's to it's the side. Dark, yeah. yeah. See the uh, eye. Far too dark. The eye. Oh, there it is. Now I can yep. see it. Now yep. I can there see it better. Teeth and the eyes. Yep. There you Got go. The reflection off of it. That's beautiful. Yeah. So that was, and that was, that was the, that went through a few different revisions because I did have. Um, well, actually, what I did have on the cover at one point is, is like the, the city on fire is on the back. Yeah. And I had okay. di- different things that would played around with where, like, um, 
I was going to have the big flames and then I thought, well, we'll have the flames kind of in the shape of a zombie. But then part of us was thinking, are people going to expect to buy this book and read about giant fire made zombies? And then that's not what it's going to be. So I didn't want to, didn't want to get slated for false advertising there. Right. Um, so I just went for the, the big zombie head. Um, and then I did show this before me, me editing copy. It's very tatty. It's been around the houses. Um, but that's so that's wicked. That, that's the zombie head there. Um, a little bit of insider knowledge for you there. Oh, nice. He's got, he's got his eye. And oh, the two together make the one. No, but it, it is the same. It's the same one. Oh, it's the same eye. So, oh, that's a little bit of a nod to uh, oh, nice. Angel, like the, the Resident Evil, that's always got the, the big eyes in the second yep, one, hasn't yep, it? Yep. So uh-huh. I thought I'd stick with a little bit little bit of a nod to that, but that's... Uh, nice. So, and then I suppose I've, I've got kind of ideas about the um, the ongoing um, covers that I want to have for the following ones, because um, the, the second book was, it was called War Ravages. Um, that's like the start of the, I suppose, the start of the war against the undead in a different country because the first book set in the UK um, the second one is starts off in South America in uh, in Rio de Janeiro and then it kind of moves north back up into America um, so that's kind of like the war starting and then the second part of the second book on this part will be um, War Ruins and I've got the idea of having the the zombie head, the zombie skull with like the head the skull kind of morphing into ruined buildings, but we'll see how that develops. We'll see how that changes as time progresses. Um, and that sounds I've, like a poster. Yeah, I've, I've, yeah. I've kind of kind of got them sketched. I've I've got a hundred different notebooks and sketchbooks all over um, with different ideas, and some some of them are some of them are like or what I've stuck to when I've written things, and some of them are things that I've kind of went back to look at and thought that would have been a really good book. I wish I'd followed it. Um, because, like I mentioned before, characters do what they want. Um, so I've got all these different books, and I, somewhere I've got sketches of what I ideally want for the covers. Um, but like I say, by the time I come onto them, they could have changed completely. We'll just have to see. I see we have a question for you, uh, for you Ben, uh, from Steve by Bosfield. He asks Bosfield. Ben, yeah, Ben, I have quite a few ideas for the zombie apocalypse for stories but I find it difficult for the United Kingdom, especially for the weapons perspective, due to the fact that we can't have firearms in the United Kingdom. How did you go around that? Um, well, the, I suppose the, the, the main thing I did was I kind of fudged it. it. It is a little bit in the future, but not like, not like well, it was further in the future when I wrote it than what it actually is now. <laughs> um, 2040 something, 2043, I think is when it's roughly based. So it's only 20 years away and if you think back 20 years, you know, things have changed, but that's, uh, yeah, things, things, see, I, I'm just, I've read it all the time on the internet, and I just think 20 years ago, 1980, because that's that's the brain of a 40-year-old, that, that just, <laughs> they don't want to acknowledge it was actually further back than that. Um, so, yeah, so it's a couple, like 10, 15 years or so, like 20 in the future, Um the way I got around it was because of the, the plague and the way it was being handled by the governments. Um, they do have, they've got some Marines in there, they've got boots on the ground. Um, so there is weapons there, um, which obviously no one's, no one's going to be expecting zombies. So they've, they've got weapons, but the, um, I suppose in, in a kind of similar way to um, the movie Aliens, they go in and the, they think that they can control things. They, they're confident in what they've got, but uh, no one expects to be overrun by the dead. So there will be dead bodies left lying around with, with their equipment and weapons there. So that's how people have come about and got stuff. Um, plus, you can get firearms in the UK, but it has to be for specific reasons. Um, and I know that, uh, I know a few different people who have got, um, they've got like the proper shotgun licenses hunt, hunt licenses so it's um there is weapons out there it's just not as prevalent as what it is in say like um america 
Um, well, basically, Rich's living room. <laughs> I'm stocked up for the apocalypse. I'm ready. <laughs> well, I think that's that's just it. I think we just have to make sure we've got a big stick ready for uh, for when it happens. Couple just of hope nails. they have soft heads. Yeah, couple couple of nails on the end just to uh, just to get it in there, and then uh, hope for the best. Well, now, some I've seen another book, though, that can be used as a weapon as far as a projectile weapon is a nail gun, mm -hmm. an old school nail gun. You can yeah. pop punk, you know, and just pop and just keep on rolling. Yeah. That pops up in a Merrill David book. I always try to give him some love because he's too <laughs> shy to come on the show, but I love him to pieces. That's why he's getting his own wing. And as we were talking about covers, I'm actually tempted to reach up and grab his books right now because I'm looking up at him. He literally uses the same cover for every book. Mm -hmm. He just changes the color. And yet it makes art. Like yeah. when I stuck it up, it's like a Jackson Pollock kind of a thing, you know, <laughs> with the same face, every picture, but it's a different color mm -hmm. and it's brilliant. And that's why I always ask authors about where they get their ideas for their covers. Cause he was like, yeah, okay. I got this zombie face. Mm -hmm. I'll just change the color. That'll work. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> that's kind of what I'm thinking. Not, 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 not like using the same picture, but a different color um, for each book because the, the first one, you kind of, I'm not going to show it again because you kind of see it reflects <laughs> the light. Um, but it's, uh, that's, um, that's green. It's got a green tint on the background and the, the face is green. Um, the second book, which is War, is got, um, obviously it's red. You've seen that before. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the next series of books, because um, the pestilence will be war, there'll be famine, and then there'll be death. So you can kind of see the, the apocalyptic horseman feel to it there um so i'm trying to going to try and go for a different a color that matches each color as it as it is as it's mentioned um so i think the, the pestilent one was um green greenish and then obviously war's red um death will be but assume white. black white. yeah i think famine's black and then i think white will be um death or that, that's cool as I've got I've got years to worry about those two colors at the minute but <laughs> so uh, it's that, safe that's... to say though there's no hot pink coming well we'll see <laughs> we might do the, the 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 Jack special edition just make it bright <laughs> neon pink <laughs> so oh, how right. do you do those covers I mean do you uh, have an artist uh, draw it up or how do you go about that the colors that the colors the covers um I've actually done myself um so i used a combination of um there was a 3d package i used for some of it and then um photoshop so i've kind of stuck with it myself it's the i suppose it's the very indie vibe um but just like with a beta readers i have the beta cover looker at us and they'll uh, they'll tell us if it works if it doesn't do anything for them and take on on board what they're what they say about that well if you ever need like a face model or whatever you know for like some creepy crazy looking zombie guy you can always <laughs> holler at angel <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's those eyebrows isn't it mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so what are your plans for the future what are you looking for long term lots and lots of writing that's really what I want to do. Um, like I said, I know this zombie story is going to be a, um, it's it's going to be a, a long series. Um, just it's the I suppose it's the time it's going to take for us to actually get it get it written out, penned down, and then ran through editing so that we can come back and tell us to write another seven chapters differently. So uh, I have to go back and write seven other <laughs> chapters differently. Um, but I don't I don't chuck everything anything away. If I'm told to rewrite something, I'll keep something on a different document and I may have stuff on there I can use at a later date somewhere else. Um, so I've, I've got a huge cut and paste document just sitting on my computer with uh, loads, of, loads of different things and phrases that I've written down and used in the past that I've had to take out, but I quite like them. So mm -hmm. I'll, keep, I'll keep them for a bit, of, a bit of flair and character in case I need them later on down the line. Okay, now here's a totally random question. At mm -hmm. just completely out of left field. In so many different book series I've read over the years, listened to over the years, 
you know, different types of vehicles get mentioned. You know, somebody mm-hmm. could wind up in like a Kia Soul or a Hyundai Sonata or a F-150 or whatever. Do you ever write a specific vehicle into any of your books just because you like it? Um, well, it's, uh, there is one in Pestilence Range. There is a, there is a, a huge vehicle that they have um, that end up polining it, shall we say, from some, uh, from some soldiers. Um, but it doesn't, it's not an, well, to the best of your knowledge, it's not a vehicle that actually exists. Um, again, taking the, the slant on the fact it's 20 odd years in the future, I kind of took some mm-hmm. liberties and made something up because why not? But it was actually based, and it's completely bizarre to say something like this now, but it was based on something I had a dream of when I was like nine, 10 years old, um, which it's essentially like, it's, I suppose it's, it's afraid it was like a mobile command center. So it's a big thing. Um, and it's got um, a huge cab and a couple of trailers and um, one trailers for um, living quarters and medical and stuff like that. The other trailer is just for the guns and explosives and anything that you can kill someone with, I guess. Um, and that, that's, that was just kind of based, like I say, it was, it was a dream that I had when I was a kid. And I thought when I grew up, because you always think weird things when you're a kid. Well, I did. Now, I still wait on my flying cars. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had this thing in my head where I was thinking, right, when I'm old enough, I'm going to have this vehicle to live in and it's going to have all this stuff. Um, it, it didn't, in my dream, because I was seven or eight, it didn't have a trailer full of um, of weapons and guns and explosives and stuff like that, but it did have a number of small dinosaurs and chummy pets. Um, hey! So, you know, that's that's potentially a completely different story altogether. I was um, going to say, are, are you still into dinosaurs? Um, not as much, no. Uh, I've I've seen Jurassic Park, if that's what you're going to ask us, but uh, I'd... Uh, I know me, me, me daughter, she was into dinosaurs when she was younger as well. So just potentially got that from me. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, so but that was, that was like the basis of this, this big vehicle um, that appeared in the, like it appears in both. I've put it in the, into the sequel now as well. So it's a, uh, it's like a reoccurring character in itself, really the big giant military vehicle that is too wide for the, our poor English roads, basically. <laughs> I can, I can stop signs down left and right. We don't even, <laughs> we don't even have stop signs over here. <laughs> what? We just go. Just go. Take no, we, your chances. We, we've got roundabouts now. That's a different beast altogether as well. Oh, my God. Don't talk about roundabouts <laughs> in the United States. We have not figured those things out yet. Nope. <laughs> nope. 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 Uh, not even well, we got it. We got a couple of them in Nashville. And every time you get to it and you're sitting there waiting your turn, you're just thinking, not today, Satan. And you just <laughs> dive out there and go and hope for the best because you don't Same know what's going to happen. Man. Same thing I've even I seen am. people. I've even seen people come the other way. Like everybody's <laughs> supposed to go this way, mm-hmm. and nope, they've got that one guy that wants to go that way. Well, maybe they're English. Maybe yeah, they're yeah, English. Maybe they're from Europe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have called them the sob that I did. Maybe they just thought they were doing the right thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, so now. I've always wondered, have you made a trip to the United States? I have. Um, I've been a few times. I've been told that it doesn't count because it was just Florida I went to. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> uh, no, no doesn't count, no. does it? No. So we've a uh, no. few family trips to Disney in Orlando. So that's just fake America, I believe. Is that, uh, is that what Yes, that would, that would be correct. Between yeah. me, Rich, and Angel, we can send you to some places oh, that yeah. you really need to go visit. Absolutely, go visit, and you'll go back home with memories you'll have for the rest of your life. Absolutely, not just that, not just that prepackaged, yeah, nonsense that you get down there. You you gotta go explore the, 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 you gotta explore the, uh, the other side, as they call it. You know, what like California Disney? Yeah, I can do that. (laughs) And I'm not frozen. We're yeah, just gonna try to look. Look at Jackie no. like, what, what, what you just said? Uh-huh. No. Those are the two states that we allow 
to continue to be part of the, the United States. We let them hang out because, ah, eh, you're kind of cool. You're over well, there. California and what? <laughs> yeah, California and Florida. Those are the two. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I, I'll take Puerto I, Rico. I got my feelings about Florida, too. Mm-hmm. That place I mean, is. I got relatives in Florida, but I would never go there. Nope. Do you know, we actually have a state that is literally the north and the south of the United States of America in one state. It's called Michigan. <laughs> the bottom part of it is what we call Yankeeville. They're true northerners. But then when you go to the north side of Michigan, you hit yeah. the upper peninsula. Yep. And that's when you get into moonshiners and basically a whole pack of rednecks straight out of the south. <laughs> hey, 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 hey Jack, there. I mean, I got a woman up there who, 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 who lives that nice farm life. And, you know, I'm thinking about going up there. So, I mean, I, I got a thing from Michigan. So, I mean, I even chip for the Michigan Wolverine. So, go figure. A Puerto Rican chain from Michigan. I know. <laughs> I'm weird. I know. But that's why we love you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so now, Ben, uh, as you kind of see the whole zombie world, the whole horror world genre from the written side, because you are an author, you are in it. You're knee deep, waist deep, hip deep. Hell, you're probably drowning in it by now. <laughs> what do you see in the future? Do you see things changing? How, what, how do you see the evolution changing? Because something I've noticed is I've been listening to audio books and seeing, you know, the new books that hit the wall, all of you guys have a different spin usually on it. Do you think that can continue? Is that sustainable? Or are we eventually going to get like typical Hollywood and it's going to be the same thing regurgitated? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, the saying that there's just, um, there's only so many different stories that you can tell anyway. I, I can't remember what the name of the proper thing is, but there's, there's supposed to be like seven basic stories um, which normally involves things like a youth and a wise man and a princess. And that, that's just the basic terminology because I, I did go to, like, to college and did a bit of stuff about that. Um, but it's, uh, I think, I think as long as people are, well, as long as people are different, basically, there's, there's always going to be some type of different slant that people are going to have on them. Um, I mean, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll touch on, on Javin and, how many people could have, <laughs> exactly how many people could have guessed of blue naked shitting peeves? That's yeah, and, and that's what happened. And yellow eyes, sorry, they've got yellow eyes as well. And they got yellow eyes. Yep. Hey, so, what's, your, what's your preference on the eyes? Um, well, everything in the ones I've written, they've just got the milky white cataract eyes. Um, that's my favorite. That's my favorite. Yeah, and uh, I think I think that is obviously like you say that that's. That's my, I suppose, me go to because that's what I think zombie is dead. So they kind of blink, so everything goes all cry, um, dusty and crunch, crunchy and just dirty, basically. So they kind of blink. Um, but then obviously you'll see them sometimes as well. It's um, in the films, in the movies where they've got um, the running, well, running and slow, I suppose, is a different, different topic altogether. Um, but we've got like, you've got the ones who, or attacking people, but they still look like human eyes, and that sometimes can add um, a bit of a oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's kind of creepy. Like yeah, it's like uh-huh. it looks like a regular person is eating exactly you at that exactly. point. You know, yeah, yeah at least if the eyes are different. Exactly, it depends on their state of decomposition. You know, I mean, yeah, that's been scientifically proven. Yeah, <laughs> um, he would know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I, I think it's i think people are always going to be able to put their own spin on something if they're if they're um inclined to, to do something then they're, they're going to have that i suppose they're going to have that uh that ability to look at that and uh, i know the the question that you asked there about the, the future and um, i've been told on several occasions that audiobooks are the way in on the future um Unfortunately, the books that I've written that I'm surrounded by are massive when it comes to uh, production and costs of making into an audiobook. Um, I think when I looked at my first book, say making that into an audiobook, I just inquired, and that was going to be over 5,000, um, which don't have that money yet um, from sales or anything to, to stump up and put towards costing. Um, so I have actually started writing. Um, a short with the intention of 
it's being done solely for being made into an audiobook to see how it will how my stuff would fare out there. Um, and when I say short, it's my short and other people's short is obviously def- different definitions because my book's 460 pages, no, 640 pages. So that's a uh, short. I think it's probably, I'm looking, I'm looking at planning about a 30 or 40,000 short, which will be, I think it's, is that classed as a, a novella? Not quite a yeah, novel. Uh, yeah. Um, 15 to 40,000. Yeah. So that, that that's that's my plan. If I can have a story like that, it'll be based in the universe, um, like the um the short that you've got there, and also mm-hmm. the um the short that I had published in the um run, is it run from the dead? Two sentences. Run from the yes, run from the dead, the one that uh the anthology that was put out by uh, Angry Eel just uh, just a couple of months ago, actually. Is that on the wall? That's on the wall. Um, so the short that I wrote that was put in there as well, that's also set, set in the same universe, in the same the same area. So that's, in, in my mind, I'm going to have a lot of, I'm going to have the main story, the main series, but also a few different shorts as well. Um, so when I'm writing the books, I can look at it and think, right, this person here is going to have a, a side story or a short story and this couple here are going to have their own little story, which I can write later on, which will dovetail into the book. Um, it may work, it may not, because if you know that the person in the book is dead, then you know that the, the short that's going to be leading up to it, it's not going to have a happy ending. But, you know, I don't think anything I've written has a happy ending really anyway. Um, well, hey, me alert. as a fan, as, <laughs> hey, as, you know, as me as a fan, I'm going to tell you now, I'm all about backstories. So even mm-hmm. if I know that a character's going to die, yeah. but all I know about them is just, you know, from book one to when they die, yeah. to get a backstory on them, I like that. I actually really do like that. Even though I know it's not going to turn out well for them, mm-hmm. it makes it even more impactful when I listen to something a second time or read something a second time, knowing that information. Or the first time, maybe I didn't, you know, you know, yeah. get a little misty right here. Now, that second time through, it might get me, you know, mm-hmm. just because it's like now all of a sudden I know this about them. And so, yeah, hell yeah, I don't have a problem with writing a character in that I already know is dead. Go for yeah. it, shit. All right, then. I'll do that. <laughs> that, that'll that be the hot pink neon Jack edition. <laughs> hey, we can do it. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, we're getting close to the end of the hour here. And I always like to wrap things up by making sure that the authors that are featured here today always get to tell everyone where to go find their stuff and how to get it. And I always like to start with my co-host and wrap it up with the main guy himself, in this case, Ben Black. Rich, where can we find you, bro? All right, so you can find me on my uh, Facebook page, Richard R. Rose Author. I do have a uh, webpage, richardrrose.com, and I am still in the process of updating, but uh, you can also, but, uh, you know, it'll be, it'll be up to speed here shortly, however, Connor. Uh, You can also find my book, Wild-Eyed Southern Boys, on Amazon, uh, Goodreads, Kindle Unlimited, and uh, it's also available in audio for on Audible and uh, iTunes and Amazon as well. Uh, working on that novella, should have it out uh, February t- uh, 2022 at the latest in early spring for book two of Wild Eyed Southern Boys. Well, hey, for the people that make moonshine, that's going to be a good one to check out because you'll learn some good and some bad of the moonshining industry. Nice. Angel, what do you yes, got going uh, on, bro? Yeah, oh yeah, so you can find me on uh, Written on Dead every day. I'm posting uh, some interesting uh, posts that you can also find me on the Legion is Evangelist Maximus, which is my fan group on Facebook. And you can also find me on Amazon, whether it's Angel Ramon to find my zombie books or Angelus Maximus to find my historical fiction books. <laughs> and uh, I'm in the process of finishing up Betrayal of the K-92 first trial. It's already written up. The first draft is done. Now it's just editing, and hopefully it'll be out for January 2022. Sweet. And you have a newsletter too, right? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. The ne- next one will be right before Christmas, so look out for that if you're on my newsletter. Fantastic. Well, Ben, advertise, baby. 
Okay, so the main book that I've written is Pestilence Reigns. If you search that on Amazon, um, you should hopefully find that book. Um, clicking on the author's um, mug, we'll say. <laughs> Click on the uh, on the, the the bulging face of the author, and you'll come to the page, which is obviously is going to have all me um, the books that are available on Amazon, which is mentioned. Pestilence Reigns. Beautiful. And me sci-fi one arachnoside. Beautiful. Um, and obviously the short that Jack had up before. Um I've forgotten its name. Dying memory. Yes, yes. Um, you'll find those on there, and then obviously when my new releases come out, they'll also be on there. Um, currently working on editing War Ravages, the sequel to Pestilence Reigns, and also Arachnoside Infiltration, which is the sequel to Infestation. No, yes. Yes, <laughs> um, and as I say, they will appear on uh, on Amazon. Amazon, um, like Angel, I hang out in the Written and Dead area on Facebook, and um, posting random shit whenever I can. <laughs> and um, you can also find me author page uh, Ben Black space dash space author on there, um, and then that's uh, that's where I should really update more than I do. But at the minute, I'm concentrating on editing getting the content out there it's the the dreaded time balance issue that everyone has that no one has the issue to yet other than cloning myself if i can do <laughs> that then uh, i'll be laughing dude i could get i could get my own ben black just to have him <laughs> around just to do stuff uh, it, it, are you going to hang him on the wall as well that's that's the thing <laughs> I can see it being more of a Kathy Bates type situation, you know. Hey, 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 you stay out of this. <laughs> I'll see your ass in May. <laughs> All right. This has been an absolute blast, a wonderful treat. I am so happy that we got you on, Ben. You are an amazing writer. You're a wonderful guy. You got a big heart, huge talent. Thank you so much for doing this with us today. For Richard Ryan Rose. For Angel Ramon, for Ben Black, for the still captured Patty Raccio. <laughs> I am Jack Childress, and we are out. All right. Bye. See, you, Bye. see you next week, guys. Thanks. Later. <laughs>